Welcome back to the War Economy and State podcast. This is the foreign policy podcast of the Mises Institute. And we're back again. This is about a monthly podcast. And so here we are back for our October episode. Uh, I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm executive editor at the Mises Institute. And with me is my co-host, Zachary Yost, who's one of our foreign policy experts. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this time, how ethnic conflicts from the old world are brought over via immigrant groups, and then uh, they form into to interest groups that then try and convince the U.S. government to become involved in a variety of foreign conflicts that really have nothing to do with the United States as a nation, as uh, protecting its borders, or the people within it. And so let's just look at some of the bizarre politics that result from this. And I think one of the first things we can look at, and while it doesn't ap apply directly to the United States, it certainly is the same phenomenon. I think we can start on this with uh, the Canadian Parliament's uh, recent effort to praise a former Nazi uh, for fighting the Russians. And the the uh, thing has died down a little bit because it's now been replaced by the the new war in Israel between Hamas and the state of Israel. Uh, but we'll actually talk about that a little bit because that ties in also to our topic. Uh, but just uh, last week, we were still talking about how <laughs> the Canadian Parliament under Trudeau, under the ruling party, had showcased and given not one but two standing ovations to a 98-year-old former member of the Waffen-SS uh, who had served within one of the SS's Ukrainian groups. And in spite of what, what supporters of that group might be telling you, this group participated in a variety of massacres of, of ethnic Poles and Jews uh, in Poland, that uh, that similar volunteers from that group had staffed uh, concentration camps uh, in Poland as well, uh, where, of course, plenty of ethnic Poles and Jews were also butchered. And yet, what we're being told is that because these people fought against Russia, that we're now supposed to praise them. See, it, it was just such a bizarre and surreal thing to watch as the Canadian Parliament was praising someone who fought against the Canadians in World War II. Uh, <laughs> because I guess members of Parliament don't remember that. I mean, you can imagine if an ordinary citizen were out there praising uh, some other country because they fought against the Allies in World War II. That person would probably be denounced, maybe called a traitor in social media and elsewhere. But if you're Ukrainian and you fight the Russians, which, of course, they weren't even really just fighting the Russians. They were fighting the Soviets, which included a lot of Ukrainians, by the way. So these were Ukrainian nationalists fighting their own countrymen uh, and then fighting against the Poles. And uh, now here we are a few decades later saying, oh, well, that's great. Uh, because the current memo is that Russians are awful, so now we're going to praise these groups. But what's remarkable and what really feeds into uh, our topic for today is that this isn't a one-time thing, that uh, Ukrainian nationalists have really set up shop in Canada, and to a lesser extent in the United States as well, where you can find memorials and plaques praising Nazi groups that were staffed by Ukrainians uh, within Canada and the United States. It's this same group that uh, this, this guy who was praised by the Ukrainian parliament or by the Canadian parliament was in. Um, it's the, the 14th Waffen SS uh, Galitsyn, as it was called, because it was named after Galicia, uh, with southern Poland and western Ukraine, uh, although what at the time was really just you know, southern and eastern Ukraine. <laughs> but, uh, and and that's something we can mention too, is that uh, western Ukraine was really under the boot of Poland for a long time. But if you go around both with the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, you can find a number of memorials to the Nazis, basically, who served in 
these units. And make no mistake, they transferred uh, non-Ukrainians in and out of the leadership. There was clear integration with the SS overall and with the Third Reich state and tried to portray these groups as uh, somehow on the margins and having no interest in the perpetuation of the Thousand Year Reich uh, is simply wrong. These people, including this guy praised by the parliament, took oaths specifically to Adolf Hitler uh, and carried out uh, efforts to uh, bring about the final solution against the Jews in Eastern Europe. And yet you can find at cemeteries and at Ukrainian churches in the UK, the US and Canada, memorials to these people. And they're praised and uh, said to be great heroes. And a lot of that is because groups of Ukrainian nationalists came to the United States. Thousands, 8,000 of these former SS soldiers were imported into the United Kingdom, uh, into groups. They then formed interest groups, in some cases even lobbying for and getting government money to build memorials to Nazis. And they are now very powerful in some local circumstances, like Alberta. The University of Alberta is known as a hotbed of Ukrainian influence, where they've set up some endowments and such through the university there and through the local government. And you can find uh, local communities in the U.S. connected to where there are local groups of Ukrainians as well who are... Uh, really either just outright praising Ukrainian Nazis are now actively involved in covering it up. And so that's just really one example of the sort of bizarre politics that are brought here. And then, of course, these groups are very involved in trying to get Americans to pay for and maybe even die in wars against the Russians because this particular and pretty small Eastern European group has managed to get uh, to gain a hearing in Congress and uh, from the White House and create uh, additional support for what the Pentagon wants to do anyway, which is start another war. And so these little interest groups then offer additional support uh, to what the regime wants to do in terms of its endless wars. And you can see that uh, in a variety of groups, of course, not just in Eastern Ukraine, or not just uh, among Ukrainians and Ukrainian nationalists. And that's that's something that you've noted before we started talking here today, is that going back to the very beginning, we can look at how some of these groups started being an issue and how uh, people who were wary of this had warned the United States against getting into uh, a lot of these conflicts uh, because they really just in no way actually benefit the United States. So why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the early history of these some of these bizarre uh, ethnic politics uh, and bedfellows that form as a result of the of old world conflicts being brought to the U.S. Just a few comments on the crazy Nazi situation in Canada. Uh, why it can be confusing to some people, as you note, is that this area of what is now Ukraine was shifting all over the map in terms of <laughs> who controlled it. If you look at Poland today, its borders, and Poland before World War II, Poland was just sort of picked up and moved to the West. Uh, what is now Western Ukraine, where basically all, of, basically Galicia, which is where all these sort of people who joined the SS came from, was part of Poland until the Soviet Union invaded Poland with Nazi Germany and annexed the area. And just to under, like, I think a point people don't get when they're like, oh, they weren't really Nazis. <laughs> you know, they just were in favor of Ukrainian self, uh, self-determination. It's like, you can argue that's true to the extent that they didn't join the SS and then they killed, you know, ethnically exterminated Poles because they joined the SS. They joined the SS because they wanted to ethnically cleanse the Poles. And a really great example of this is <laughs> this controversial city in the uh, in Western Ukraine that starts with an L. <laughs> and how you identify that city <laughs> is sort of like a flag of what your politics are. I believe the city is currently called Lvov. Before in Soviet times, it was called Lviv. In Polish, no, no, times, it's Lviv, it's Lviv now. Oh, okay. L V I V, is it not? <laughs> yes, yes. 
but with Poland, it was Lvov with with W. Yes, yes, right? with W. Yes, yes. And before that, it was Lemberg. <laughs> And Lemberg is where Mises was born, when it was part of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. So just sort of a connection there. Um, and the, that plays into the whole dispute within Ukraine, just for context of why the situation is so complicated. Because Ukraine, there is this sort of Galician identity, and then that gets more muddled and mixed the further east you go, where in the very eastern part of Ukraine, as you might expect, people very much identify with Russia. And in the middle of the country, it's more of a mix. So that just is some context of why the situation is so convoluted. But anyway, back to the United States. Uh, I mean, yeah, as you've said from the very beginning, during the, there's sort of two components to it. One is ideological and the other is ethnic. And there's lots of examples of both throughout American history. At the beginning, it was more ideo mighty ideological. When the French Revolution broke out, lots of people were like, yes, freedom! <laughs> Screw the British! We should, you know, declare war and join the French. And we had an alliance with France from the Revolution, and <laughs> France wanted us to do that. And George Washington just sort of was like, uh, no. <laughs> he just chucked the whole alliance out the window. I mean, everyone now is obsessed with American credibility. Our first alliance, we literally just said no. We just said, well, this doesn't really work for us. And the excuse was, oh, there's a new French government, so the alliance <laughs> isn't with them. But it's a pretty, that's a pretty valid excuse, though. I mean, well, what yes, did you say? But also <laughs> at, in the, at the core <laughs> issue is there's no American interest. Whether France was... <laughs> Uh, under the monarchy or not, I suspect Washington would have done the same. And we should know that Washington, even among the mainstream scholars, consistently ranks in the top five of the greatest presidents. Yes. So uh, to be a good president, just chuck uh, out the window uh, stupid alliances, as, as Washington did. That's a good lesson to learn, I think. And there's a saying variously attributed to different people throughout history, but that states have no friends only interests. And I think that's a very helpful thing to keep in mind. And so then one of the next huge sort of examples of Americans working themselves up into a moral fervor was the Greek War of Independence, which was sort of the Ukraine War of the day in terms of uh, capturing the popular imagination. And part of it was due to so many people were classically educated. So they just imagined like, oh, these heroic Greeks of yore, these Homeric heroes are fighting against the evil Turkish Muslim oppression. And in reality, if you know anything about the Greek War of Independence, it was not like that at all. It was sort of mostly hill bandits and there's hilarious stories of what happened to American aid that was shipped over there. And it's also where um, Lord Byron died because uh, he was so obsessed with, uh, he was a Greekaboo, <laughs> as the term has come to be coined. Uh, he had no military experience, but he had a ton of money. So they just went to Greece and they put him in command and then he uh, died of disease during a siege. But anyway, there's a really great quote from a book called A Diplomatic History of the American People, uh, which I will read. Uh, in 1821, the Greeks had revolted against Turkish tyranny. The enthusiasm for their cause, which speedily sprang up in America, had numerous roots. The Greeks were imitating America's revolutionary blow for liberty. They were challenging the despotic policies of the Holy Alliance. They were Christians battling against Muslim infidels, and they were the classical creators of Western civilization. The so-called Greek fever was further heightened by atrocity stories. The Turks reputedly collected bushels of Greek ears. Pro-Greek enthusiasm also took the form of sermons, orations, balls, mass meetings, poems, resolutions in Congress, and the solicitation of funds. Yale College students alone contributed $500. And then it goes on to say how Secretary of State John Quincy Adams was just like, uh, we're not going to get involved in any of this. So all aid was private aid. And that was also screwed up, as is generally a tradition. Then we can go to sort of 
what I understand to be one of the first ethnic <laughs> examples of uh, sort of for, foreign lobbying, foreign lobbying slash using America as a, you know, pedestal for advancing grievances from the old world. And that is the Fenian raids after the Civil War, which is, uh, I'm not sure how widely this history is known, but uh, after the Civil War, all these Irish veterans, you know, trained in the military and once and whatnot, literally invaded Canada on several occasions, like by the hundreds and the thousands. <laughs> and uh, the plan was, you know, oh, we'll basically take Canada hostage and use it to as a bargaining chip for Irish independence. And uh, there was tons of Irish immigrants in the United States at the time, and they also had a large influence on politics. The whole um, Tammany Hall in, in New York City was sort of an ethnic political, you know, uh, interest group, effectively. Um, let's see, this also played a role in the Cuban Revolution. There was lots of yellow journalism in the United States of uh, reporting Spanish atrocities, all that sort of stuff. Another very important example of this is the China lobby. And here I have a short quote from Perilous Partners, of which uh, was uh, uh, co-authored by Ted Galen Carpenter and Malau Innocent. By the way, uh, Ted Carpenter gave a really superb speech at a recent Mises event that everyone should check out on the current state of libertarian foreign policy. But... Um, he says, the influence of the China lobby made any suggestion of reducing or qualifying U.S. support for Chiang, this is Chiang Kai-shek, politically hazardous. John Newhouse, a senior fellow at the World Security Institute who analyzed the influence of lobbies on U.S. foreign policy, concluded that the China lobby, quote, was the superpower of lobbies representing foreign causes in the United States. That was an accurate depiction. As he notes, from the 1940s, when Chiang addressed a joint session of Congress, to the 1970s, no U.S. president challenged the so-called China lobby, which opposed all contacts with mainland China. Then he goes on to list all these politicians from the er uh, era who were exceedingly pro-Taiwan, uh, one of whom was nicknamed the Senator from Formosa. <laughs> uh, so, moving on... Going back to Ireland, I mean, literally, people were fundraising for the IRA in the 70s and whatnot during the Troubles. I think Peter King was heavily involved in that. Uh, there's a joke uh, about Iranian ex expats. There's this video on, like, the Hill TV or something of this Iranian expatriate from L.A. or something being interviewed where he's like... Oh, it's good that the U.S. is invading Iraq, but really, Iran, <laughs> they need to bomb Iran. And it's like the, the most sane Iranian expatriate was the joke. Then, of course, there's the Israel lobby, which people well know about, but it's a point I try to emphasize is the Israel lobby is not anything of an aberration in American politics. We also have the Venezuelan lobby. I mean, the Armenian lobby, although the Armenian lobby is tiny. So that's why it's taken them 100 years to get the U.S. to recognize the Armenian genocide and whatnot. It's all sorts of interest groups. Uh, earlier today on Ballotpedia, I looked up the list of caucuses in the United States Congress. I mean, it, it's insane the number of foreign caucuses. I mean, basically <laughs> caucuses that are there to represent foreign interest groups. I mean, it's from big ones like you might expect to literally an Assyrian caucus. Uh, I mean, it's all over the place. So this, there's a long history of this in America. Yeah, and we should note that it can be even integrated into the political parties themselves, right? Because Jefferson hated the British so much, the Democratic Party starts out as a very anti-British party. Um, and that colors policy a lot, whereas the Federalists and later the more Whig and Republican side of things was more pro-British. Uh, when you look at a lot of the rhetoric around the War of 1812, uh, the British were kind of dismayed and didn't understand why the United States would side with 
the French, that's the way the British saw it, was that in the War of 1812, they couldn't believe the Americans were basically declaring war on the British while the British were involved in trying to uh, end Napoleon's despotic rule in Europe. They're like, I thought Americans were pro-freedom, right? Like, we got Napoleon running around trying to establish a Europe-wide police state. This this guy hates freedom of any kind. And the Americans are are fighting us. And But a lot of that just came from anti-British sen- sentiment within the Democratic Party. And then later, of course, he started to get a lot of Irish in, and that just made, of course, the anti-British side of the party far more invigorated then. So that continued then for a few more decades after that. So you could you can go back and you can trace just straight up anti-British policy based on which party is in the White House or is in charge of Congress throughout much of the 19th century. And so, yes, as you say, it's uh, the Israel lobby is hardly something that's unique in American political history. And I would, as a, as, as a side note, there is one major exception to this. And that is German Americans. German Americans are the largest ethnic group <laughs> in America, but uh, are very odd. I, I guess I could say we are very odd. My last name is Yost. <laughs> uh, in that most German Americans don't identify as such or even know they are. And I think this stems from a whole bunch of different reasons. Tons of German immigrants came to the United States before the state of Germany (laughs) existed. Um, In my own case, my Yost great-great-grandfather who came was not from even Germany, which had just been established at that time. He was from Austria-Hungary, and his wife was from Switzerland. (laughs) So both Germans, but not from the state of Germany. And there is actually a German caucus in in Congress, but it was not formed until about 10 years ago. So uh, that is interesting. And also, uh, I think Murray Rothbard has written about in his like thing about pietists, uh, I forget what that essay is, but he wrote about how sort of like the Germans were sort of this pro-freedom <laughs> uh, group that people tried to mobilize. But um, I think uh, really what what this shows is that they're sort of like a Jekyll and Hyde of American foreign policy. We have George Washington's farewell address, which I want to read some excerpts from in a little bit. Uh, but we also have the, you know, the Greek of and the Franca files and all of that from the beginning. Um, Robert Nisbet has an excellent quote in, uh, in his book, The Present Age, where he, he says something like, the history of American foreign policy is full of moralism, where Americans, and, and John Mearsheimer has written about this, Americans don't like to think in terms of real politic and national interests and whatnot. We like to think of like moral crusades. And people can identify where this comes from. I mean, I think part of it comes from the whole mentality of the city on the hill. Whereas if you think of yourself in that way, and if... I think at the beginning, the city on the hill idea was like, we can be a shining example for all of the, the nugget savages in the, in the rest of the world. But that easily gets corrupted, and there's clear history of that happening. Um, the War for Righteousness by uh, a professor at Hillsdale, whose name escapes me, is a really great example of that history. But it becomes, where the city on the hill, we're a good example to, where the city on the hill... It is our moral duty to descend to the dark depths of savage humanity and save them from themselves. Uh, So I think that is part of this Jekyll and Hyde mentality. Um, And you would think, given all the rhetoric in contemporary foreign policy, that, you know, the American tradition is running the world. Everyone now is freaking out. Look, America's not involved. Biden is weak. The world's falling apart. And that those of us in favor of realism and restraint are some sort of aberration from the norm. This is not true at all. This is completely false. Uh, And really, the the current status quo only emerged in World War II, really. Um, uh, And uh, there's a book. uh, uh, We'll put it in the show notes. The book's name escapes me. But it just came out detailing how we went from like 
America, Monroe Doctrine to America, running the world in the course of like <laughs> five years. It's important to recognize just how new that is uh, as a tradition. And I think that they recognized as well that embracing one ethnic group or another could, could also uh, drive conflicts at home and could be a problem in domestic politics as well. And you just didn't want to be seen as supporting one particular group uh, over another. And then, of course, if you were the Democratic Party, then you just had this big hodgepodge of a variety of different ethnic groups with none particularly dominant. You had, in the 19th century, so many German immigrants, but, but as you know, right, not necessarily from Prussia or any particular single state, uh, but uh, Germans overall as a group came, as did tons of Irish. And then later you started to get some of the Southern European ethnic groups. And a lot of those gravitated toward the Democratic Party, which until the 1890s was actually the laissez-faire party. So often tended to be the party that actually shied away from a lot of war involvement and government spending. And uh, it was channeled pretty well, uh, all of that that new immigrant energy came to the U.S., actually embraced localism and laissez-faire uh, uh, within the Democratic Party. And so that was a, a remarkable thing that happened then, whereas you see just openly encouraging the opposite now, where this we're just constantly hearing about, oh, this country did this horrible thing to that other country, and there's completely no recognition of the actual complexity that exists uh, back in these countries in the old world. And that's what you see with the Ukrainian thing, where uh, I got a lot of angry emails from people, which is predictable, because anytime you write about Eastern Europe, you always get a bunch of these people um, sending you a bunch of emails. Uh, but they were like, well, you know, the the Ukrainians, they they had to make a choice between the Nazis and the Soviets. And uh, my favorite is when they learned something about World War II last week and they think they're going to blow your mind with, with some new facts. And they're like, did you know that Stalin caused a famine in Ukraine? That's why the Ukrainians didn't like him. Like, gee, thanks. Thanks for that tidbit uh, which, that we were unaware of. Which, by the way, these, the Galicians who joined the SS were not part of the Soviet Union during that famine, by the way. All the people who died in the famine, their relatives fought in the Red Army. Well, oh, and that's, by the way, one of the reasons that they were able to trick the UK and Canada into giving them um, status as refugees in their countries was that they convinced these countries that they were really Poles. Um, and since Poland was an ally and not part of the Soviet Union, um, they got they got ben they got support from the church and from a variety of Western governments saying, well, you can't you can't send poles back. We we got to give freedom to these poles and not force them to live under the Soviet Union. And so that was something that went in their favor, as they pretended to be Polish in many cases. Uh, but we might note, by the way, that the poles did not join. Now they were legally barred from joining the SS. But the amount of collaboration among the Poles uh, to help the Germans was very, very low and was never institutionalized the way it was in a lot of foreign countries. You never had the sort of pro-Nazi Polish nationalist groups in Poland that you had in Ukraine. So the Poles walked that line much better where they didn't like the Nazi or they didn't like the Soviets. I mean, they had just been in a war with the Soviet Union in the 20s. And they obviously didn't like the Nazis either because they'd already been butchered in huge numbers. Uh, and so they walked that line much better, refusing to really take sides, trying to balance the two sides against the other. Whereas the Ukrainians uh, who joined the SS, as you say, they were just happy to slaughter Poles. Um, and anti-Semitism was huge in Western Ukraine uh, as well, as I note in a recent article, right? The, this is just some of the complexity that we're just told to forget. The, uh, the 1941 uh, pogroms that occurred in Lvov uh, at the time with uh, mostly enthusiastic Ukrainian participation at the egging on of the Nazis. And that was just part of life uh, in Western Ukraine. And uh, it wasn't eschewed by the native population at all. And it was, and as I was looking at some of the photos from the pogroms, by the way, 
there's one of a Ukrainian man just kicking a Jewish man, uh, like an elderly Jewish man is like down on his hands and knees and this this guy's just giving him a kick in the gut. And I'm thinking, you know what? That could have been Ludwig von Mises if he'd hung around there uh, another generation. And so to just now try and pretend that that doesn't exist and that therefore there's an automatic good guy in this conflict, whoever was against the Russians was the good guys, even if you joined the Nazis, really bizarre framing. But it's part of this uh, American need uh, to identify the good guys and the bad guys in every conflict. But in reality, in tons of conflicts, and even in wars that you might agree with, there's always theaters within that conflict where there are no good guys. And both sides are bad guys. World War I was just a bunch of bad guys killing each other. Uh, as you noted, the Greek War of Independence was a lot of bandits versus the Turks who weren't good guys either. There was no one to root for. And it was the same way in Western Ukraine as well. But we're, we're told you have to pick a side and you have, to, you have to support one side or the other. But that's untrue. The American tradition until the 20th century was to not pick a side. And that's the more reasonable position. Um, and of course, would be the, is the reasonable position right now for new conflicts that we're facing both in Eastern Europe and in the Levant. Yeah, and I think it's, it's helpful to think, it just in terms of like, pe- people say, oh, you know, it's such a tough decision. You know, you weren't in this situation that these people were in. And that's, that's completely true. But that's sort of the point. You know, Monroe Doctrine. We're over here in the Western Hemisphere. We don't have, you know, there's not a blood feud between uh, between, uh, (laughs) uh, America and Canada or America and Mexico or really anyone over here. Uh, In a way, you know, I'm usually not in favor of Thomas Paine's whole thing about, oh, we have the power within ourselves to begin the world anew. I think that's crazy talk. But... In a way, it's true here in the Western Hemisphere. There's not these blood feuds going back for centuries. And it, if people want to have an interest in world affairs and try and parse through things, or if your family is from one of these areas, it's understandable that people have some level of interest. But I think when it comes to American policy, we need to take a step back and say, you know, That's the old world. Those are those old world problems. It it sucks to be an Israeli right now, and it sucks to live in Gaza right now. It's a horrible situation. What happened over the weekend was sickening. I couldn't even believe it was going on. I mean, and it gives, it proves just how ridiculous the idea that history has ended is. I mean, this, this was like a literal barbarian raid, which was the norm for most of human history. I mean, even not very long ago, I mean, like one or two million people were killed in the Congo in the 90s. I mean, it's uh, this is how the world has been for most of human history. But we don't have to get involved in these horrible situations. We can, you know, if we are so inclined, believe one side is better than the other, we can send aid, or if you want, go and fight. Go and do that. I mean, lots of Americans have done that throughout history. But when it comes to lobbying for the United States foreign policy to become involved in these situations, it's sort of nutty. And I think here it'd be good to read some very superb quotes from George Washington in his farewell address. Sort of the last third is about foreign policy. And uh, we'll post it in the links so everyone can read the whole thing. But uh, he goes on basically criticizing the idea of favoring one state over another. Um, And he says that the nation which indulges towards another Uh, towards another, a a habitual hatred or a habitual fondness is in some degree a slave. It is a slave to its animosity or to its affection, either of which is sufficient to lead it astray from its duty and its interest. Antipathy, uh, Antipathy in one nation against another disposes each more readily to offer insult and injury, to lay hold of a slight cause 
of umbrage, and to be haughty and intractable when accidental or trifling occasions of dispute occur. You can look at all the rhetoric towards Iran right now. Iran is on the other side of the planet. What they do has no effect on American security. Uh, I mean, people could make the argument in the past, oil has to keep flowing out of the uh, Gulf. Well, America is now basically energy independent. I mean, <laughs> and before the war in Ukraine, actually our largest uh, importer aside from Canada and Mexico was Russia. So uh, we don't really get oil from the Middle East. Um, another quote, so likewise a passionate attachment to one nation for another produces a variety of evils. Sympathy for a favorite nation, facilitating the illusion of an imaginary common interest in cases where no real common interest exists, and infusing into one the enmities of the other, betrays the former into a participation in quarrels and wars, the latter without adequate inducement or justification. Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh, then... Uh, Yes. Here's. I don't want to just read the whole thing, but here's one final. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it's really good, right? This is really insightful. Yeah, I mean, stuff. so many great points. Um, one which was super fitting for Ukraine, um, because it's explicitly about Europe. Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none or a very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it must be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the, order, in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics or the ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or enmities. Our, and this, I think, is the, you know, the, the core line here which everyone needs to go and read at least this last third of his talk. But our detached and distant situation invites and enables us to pursue a different course. If we remain one people under an efficient government, the period is not far off when we may defy material injury from external annoyance. When we may take such an attitude as will cause the neutrality we may at any time resolve upon to be scrupulously respected, when belligerent nations under the impossibility of making acquisitions upon us will not lightly hazard the giving us provocation, when we may choose peace or war as our interest guided by justice shall counsel, why forgo the advantages of so peculiar a situation? Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice? And he also says that uh, we should have tons of commercial integration with everyone, but no political integration. Uh, and I think that's the root of it. We have our own situation here. America is so blessed. It's beyond crazy. What a good situation we are here in the U.S. Like, uh, look at Poland, I think, is a great example. They're just hundreds of years of wars, mass killings, being invaded by all their neighbors. I mean, that's why, I mean, uh, it's understandable why the Galicians want their own state. <laughs> because, you know, they were just, you know the zone where all the wars happened, which led to mass killing and whatnot. We don't have to deal with that here. And I would just caution people before they go nuts about, you know, Ukraine or the situation in Israel right now, to just take a step back and recognize how blessed we are, how fortunate we are that we don't have these horrible geopolitical situations to deal with. And I see it, I mean, it, People get annoyed at the Israel lobby, which I understand. I just went on a whole rant about all this foreign influence. But there's also obviously a Palestinian lobby. And I, I mean, I see some libertarians making what I think are sort of, uh, sort of a bad move in terms of picking one side or the other or just saying F everyone. I mean, I've literally seen tweets like that. F Israel, F Palestine, F Iran. 
And I say, I would caution that I think George Washington's position is much more wise and better for your soul on an individual level, which is just peace and friendship with all. These aren't our fights. Uh, all sorts of horrible things have happened in history. And here in the new world, we have a chance to sort of sidestep around that. And uh, I think we'd be very wise to do that. I think part of the problem uh, occurs because what you get are people who live very much in the now. And so looking at these horrific images, right, of the Hamas invasion and the music um, festival, I mean, just the kidnappings, the murders, uh, the desecration, horrible, right? But for a lot of people, this is the, this seems new to them. This seems unprecedented. This they can't imagine what could possibly have made made anybody think that this is uh, the right way to respond to something that came before. Now, I'm not saying I think that <laughs> war crimes of this variety are permissible. I don't think they're permissible from our side either, even though the U.S. does perpetrate this sort of thing um, in uh, and has done so in a variety of wars uh, in the 20th century, right up to and including uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But to to think that, oh, OK, well, this this horrible massacre is so unusual in its badness that clearly now it requires Americans to get involved uh, shows a certain naivete uh, and just a lack of a total lack of uh, familiarity with what the reality is in most of these places. And we're not talking, we're not saying you got to go back to ancient history to come up with similar sorts of things. This is what the, the people who come down when libertarians or others, or right, hardcore leftists, come down squarely in favor of the Palestinian side, which I don't do. Um, this is the stuff they point out, is the sorts of massacres that have taken place, uh, the shootings, uh, the, the stolen land, from Palestinians who have been a victim in many cases for a long, long time. And so now that's what that's what fuels this this latest massacre. And it goes back and forth. And I wrote a column uh, yesterday opposing uh, any U.S. involvement in this war. But I didn't pick a side. There isn't a good guy to pick here. And I guarantee you that what's going to happen to the Palestinians as a result of this invasion is going to be mass death, uh, destruction of infrastructure, entire neighborhoods in Gaza. And they're not going to hold back. If anything, it just gives more excuses to the state of Israel to just absolutely decimate uh, the Palestinian population. And you can argue that to a certain extent, uh, this was brought upon the women and children there by the leadership in Gaza. But you can see how complex that is and how insane it would be for the United States to get involved in that. And I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like thankful that I am not Israeli because I don't have to deal with this. I mean, I, it's horrible. I have no idea what Israel should do to fix this solution, to, to respond to this. Uh, I, I understand. People are like, we need to just glass Gaza. I think that's not the right decision, but I understand why people react that way. And I understand why there are Palestinian people who are, you know, willing to go out and just uh, execute old grandmas. I, that's horrible. That's wrong. And you could also go from the angle of it's, uh, it's worse than a crime. It's a mistake. Going back to your point of I've been trying to parse, I mean, I've mostly tried to avoid the Israel-Palestinian conflict because it seems unsolvable and uh, depressing, uh, but uh, I've been trying to figure out what the purpose of Hamas's actions here were. Like, on some level, I'm like, were they the, the dog that caught the bumper of the car they were chasing and that they succeeded beyond what they were hoping to, and now they're like, oh, we're really you know, screwed here. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, as you said, this is horrible. Like the response is going to be very bad for the inhabitants of Gaza and potentially elsewhere. I mean, if the a war spreads, but 
just to harp on the point, this is a hugely complicated issue. And of course, there's no excuse for just going on like a literal Viking raid, a modern day Viking raid of just literally raping, pillaging, killing. Uh, but we don't have to be involved in parsing out this conflict that seems like it's not going to be solved. I mean, history, these conflicts are usually not solved. Uh, their solution, quote unquote, is one side being wiped out. And we generally don't do that anymore in these modern times. So instead, we have conflicts that just uh, continue on interminably forever, which I suppose is better than just mass ethnic cleansing, although we just saw ethnic cleansing take place in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, but it, the world's a, a, a bad place. It, it, this gets to the, the horrible idea uh, after the end of the Cold War that history has ended. Democracy is, the, is now the norm. All, peace shall reign. I think this is crazy talk. I think ultimately the world we live in is still a world of real politik. It is still the world of the Melian dialogue, where the, the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. And this is not an endorsement of this as some sort of moral principle. It is a recognition of the reality of human existence. And we need to take a step back and say, wow, here in America, we don't really have that too much. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, lots of bad things happen to Native Americans, but we don't have a, a blood feuds going on for thousands of years. I mean, uh, we, we can avoid all that. We should really seriously appreciate that and reflect on that when advocating for a course of action. Well, in fact, the uh, the Hamas-Israel conflict makes me uh, just kind of cringe a little bit thinking about how much some of it mirrors 19th century America in terms of uh, you had some tribes, some, not all, who would they would be backed into a corner by the American regime, placed on what was effectively a reservation. They would break out of the reservation, massacre a few nearby villages, return to the reservation, and then the U.S. government would send a detachment or the, the local state would send a militia to basically go and slaughter as many uh, tribal members as they could. So the back and the forth, the, the, the sort of killing of women and children on both sides, uh, it's not even alien to the American experience. It's just, as you say, the the natives were reduced to such small numbers that they were rendered politically impotent. And so that problem was, quote unquote, solved. Uh, whereas that's not the situation in Israel right now uh, with the Palestinians. And so uh, it's uh, it's it's a little disingenuous of Americans to get a little too high and mighty about it um, <laughs> because we, we already went through all of that. And I don't think, I don't think we can endorse the American solution to that right. problem <laughs> either. So that's just an ongoing issue. And uh, so just another reason to just stay mute uh, if you're not, if you don't have a reason to be directly involved. And I might know that if you get on a plane and you go over there and you want to fight, finance it yourself, join up with a foreign military and live out your convictions, I'm not going to actually badmouth you for that. I, I kind of would admire you. Um, but to call for Americans to pay for it and Americans who have no stake in it to get involved, well, uh, you know, mind your own business. And this also goes back to our Monroe Doctrine episode where we sort of went on a tangential rant about immigration and just this idea. Um, I mean, one of the, to me, shocking things that has come out is all the pro-Palestinian protests all around the West, some of which where people are shouting horrific things. And I think it just sort of demonstrates, other people have pointed this out, uh, I forget his name, Aaron, a uh, radio host um, uh, on... Uh, the blaze has like pointed out like 10 times that you know the the bill we're trying to be sold by people promoting basically open borders and i am pro-immigration i think our immigration system is horrible it's a disaster 
Uh, but people really seem to forget basic economics, that there's trade-offs to everything in life. And just saying there's no downside to having all these immigrants with huge ethnic blood feuds come to the United States, I think is ridiculous. It's silly. And it's, you know, I think burying your head in the sand and ignoring the basic economics that you teach as a living. And as you pointed out, in contrast, you know, Western Hemisphere, all these Latino immigrants, <laughs> they don't usually bring these blood feuds with them. They're, they're not, you know, uh, I'm not aware of any, you know, Mexican lobby trying to have the U.S. invade Mexico to oust the government or to, I don't know, fight against Mexico's historic enemy, which I guess would be us. I don't, I don't know who else would fight. <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess the French also. But um, it's. Uh, I think this is just something that should be considered. I'm not, I mean, there are people who are like, this is proof we need to close the borders. I don't think that's the <laughs> solution at all. But I think we just need to be more realistic that, you know, the rest of the world has thousands of years of blood feuds and just ethnic hatred that does not easily go away. And it especially doesn't go away when it's sort of like government policy to like preserve <laughs> them. I mean, here in Pittsburgh, I mean, I can talk to my grandparents and hear about, you know, it was scandalous when, you know, a Catholic would marry a Protestant and all that. I mean, but because of sort of pro-integration policies, now no one cares. Um, and I think we just need to also factor that in when making policy. Yeah, that that exists to an extent in the United States, but it's it's clearly not on the same level. And there's a certain charm to the fact that Americans don't bother to remember history at all. So in Eastern Europe, where it's like baked into your education that you remember the time the neighboring country invaded your village in the year 791 and murdered a bunch of your ancestors and you're still mad about it. Americans, right? Americans don't even remember that they stole half of Mexico. Um, <laughs> and, the Mex and the Mexicans don't seem to care that much either, really, in spite of all that talk about Mexican immigrants coming here and founding Aztlan <laughs> and rejoining Mexico. Zero interest in that among 95% of probably 99% of Mexican immigrants. So yeah, it's a totally different situation with new world immigrants. And yeah, if you're going to talk about how immigration fuels these sorts of ethnic uh, interest groups, you, you need to look a little bit, I think, a little more detail at, okay, which immigrants are we talking about? Which parts of the world and it wouldn't even be an issue if the people in government would just get a clue and stop getting the U.S. involved in these sort of conflicts in general. And, and on the point of history, like one of my sort of side hobby interests that I pursue for fun is Indo-European studies. And this is actually a huge issue in the Ukraine war. <laughs> I mean, uh, people literally going back to like 3000 B.C., arguing about, you know, Ukrainians are the real Indo-Europeans, uh, proto-Indo-Europeans. Uh, you know, the Russians are not real white people. <laughs> I mean, it's very common to encounter people saying the Russians are basically Asiatic mutts who are, you know, uh, not purebred. Um, I mean, this is we're talking 5000 years ago here. <laughs> I mean, this and I mean, it's also a huge deal in India. Indo-European origins, I mean, like, people will be killed for basically stating what all of the genetic evidence points to, that Indo-Europeans invaded India. <laughs> the Indo-Europeans did not come from India. Uh, I mean, we can avoid all that. Everyone here is from somewhere else. Uh, so we don't have to become involved in these horrible, intractable problems that have not been solved in centuries. I think we should probably just let it go at that. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 I haven't even checked the news today on what's going on in Israel, but I'm sure it's thoroughly depressing, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and so we'll, I don't know, hopefully it'll die down by next month and maybe we won't have to talk about it then uh, in our next episode. But 
but we'll look, we'll see. Uh, and uh, but this just adds another war for us to talk about. We got we got Israel, we got Ukraine, we got the China, Taiwan situation, and I mean we haven't even done an episode on Africa. Um, and contrary to what people seem to think, um, there are, there are plenty of massacres and horrible things going on there, even though we're only told about such things when they occur in the Mediterranean or in Eastern Europe. And, uh, so just for any illustration of horrible things going on, just check Nigeria and, uh, you can be reminded at the, uh, the horribleness of the human condition overall, uh, in all regions of the globe and just how lucky we are here in North America. So with that, uh, thank you for listening to War Economy and State. Thank you to my co-host, Zachary, and we'll be back next month with another one. So we'll see you next time. Ah, that was a depressing episode. <laughs> <laughs>